Okay, so um, yeah, this is a uh, four hundred. So this is the last session of the day um, until we do the uh, quick sessions upstairs at 4 o'clock. I believe those will be upstairs. Sato San is going to More short music is the co-author of all of the volumes of the design and implementation of the ESD and FreeBSD operating systems. He's been working on file systems since I was uh, very small. Um, and today he's going to give you a brief history of the BSD fast file system, so please give him your attention. Thank you, George. Okay, um, so the, the purpose actually of trying to do this is not just because you might want to know about the fast file system, but also because it really looks at the technology of file systems uh, over the last 25 or 30 years. So, when Unix first came out, which would have been 1972 or so, they had a file system in there um, which set the, the tone, if you will, for the way that file systems were going to be done in Unix for a long time. They had the notion of inodes in there, indirect blocks, uh, tree structured uh, directories, etc. Um, but it was a, the, the implementation was very simple. And in particular, the file system only had a notion of blocks that were the size of the disk sectors, which were 512 bytes. And there was no notion of trying to lay things out continuously. They just had a free list, which was all of the unused blocks on the file system and they would simply take the next block off the list and that's what you would get. And fairly quickly that list would get scrambled and so you'd get one block at the beginning of the disk and the next block of your file would be at the end of the disk and the third one might be in the middle of the disk. And so reading a file was a slow process. They also didn't really understand that you had to protect the metadata and so after a crash in the system, you could end up with your file system in a state that you couldn't recover it. And of course, there was no program like FSCK, so it required going in by hand and patching the, the various blocks on the disk until you got your file system back together again. Luckily, file systems were so small that it didn't really matter that much. So we did two things. One is to add B writes to critical places so that the metadata would always be coverable. We uh, created FSDK, which was really just sort of pulling together the existing three tools, iCheck, NCheck, and DCheck, and automating it so that it could repair without having the operator have to tell it what to do. We also increased the block size from 512 to 1K blocks. So we just took all the, all the blocks, all the sectors on the disk and just said the minimum allocation is two sectors at a time. And this nearly doubled the performance of the file system because the, the total dominating cost was the long seeks between the blocks which were horribly laid out. And if you cut the number of seeks in half, that doubled the performance. But this told us that seeking was important and gave us uh, input that let us believe that if we could lay the blocks out better, um, we would be able to get better performance. Because even with this change, we were only utilizing about 4% of the bandwidth of the disk. Now in those days, the processors were so slow that that was sort of OK. But the processors were getting quicker faster than the disks were getting quicker, as has continued to this day. And so 4% wasn't a whole lot. Uh, the other thing is, if you're ever looking for a project to work on, look for one that does this badly. Because even if you only get half the bandwidth of the disk, you still are doing 10 times better than what was there before. And you look really good. <laughs> So in 1982, the FAST file system uh, came into existence. Uh, this was actually the brainchild of a guy named Bill Joy, who was running the project at Berkeley at the time. And 
he pulled me aside uh, when I had a, a summer when I needed a little extra money. And so he said, well, I have this project, and I could pay your summer wages, and you could just prototype this little idea I have for a file system. And of course, he knew full well that by the end of the summer, I would have prototyped it, and then it would only be 18 more months to get it all working. But of course, he didn't tell me that at the time. So the idea was you have a hybrid block size. So you can have big blocks for big files and small blocks for little pieces for small files. And when we first deployed it, we made the big blocks for kilobytes and the small blocks 512. And the, the, the big sort of intuition was instead of having all the three blocks on a list, we had a bitmap. So if you had allocated one block, we could look around and find other blocks that were nearby. And if this file system is still in use today on Solaris and Darwin and most of the BSDs, uh, with, of course, a few more changes as you will see. So that went along for a while. And the next idea to come along was this idea of saying, well, if one file system is good, two's got to be better, we might be better yet. And so uh, we introduced this notion of file system stacks. And the idea is that you can take file systems and just sort of plug them in in layers. So instead of having all the functionality in one module, you can build individual modules, and you pay the cost of that module only if you use it. So we started out with the very useless e-operation not supported file system, and we put that at the very bottom. And then we put the fast file system on top of that. And then if you decide, well, I'd like to export that file system, you push the NFS server module on top of that. And for local uh, environments, that is one where you, everyone has the same UIDs and GIDs, uh, you simply export the file system as is. But if you're exporting to another system where you have a completely different password file with different UIDs or different group IDs, you can push on this UID, GID mapping module, and it maps from whatever the remote one is to whatever that corresponds to locally. So for the local folks, they don't pay the cost of this mapping. And for the remote ones, they get the functionality at that extra cost. And the way these modules work is they see all of the operations as they come in. And they can look at it, and they can say, well, do I care about this? For example, if it's an operation where there's a credential, we're going to obviously have to remap it. But we're not going to do any of the rest of the file system. We'll just then pass the on down with the change credential to run through the rest of the stack. So similarly, NFS may do some protocol swapping, but ultimately hands it off to UFS. And UFS presumably finally handles it. And if some operation makes it all the way to the bottom and no layer touches it, then it just hits the bottom here and operation not supported comes back up. So it, we have, for example, start and end transaction, and there's no file system along this stack that does that. Then when you try and do start transaction, you put an error back, saying, nope, can't do that. And over time, a lot of different modules have been written. There's the union mount file system and the loopback file system, and another number of others uh, that have all fit into this model. So it's actually proven to work fairly effectively. By 1988, disks had started getting bigger, and we were willing to waste a little more space to get a little more speed. Pretty much every time you double the block size, uh, you get at least a 50% improvement in performance, if only because you have fewer indirect blocks, you have fewer seeks involved, and just sort of the economies of, of doing less work. So we went up to an 8 kilobyte block for the 1 kilobyte sector. Uh, this means now that a small file uh, will use a minimum of two sectors. Uh, it only ended up wasting about 1.4% of the dish, of disk space and was well worth it for the performance gain. So in 1990, we began noticing this problem, which was that you would create a file system 
but over time, the, the file system would start to get it a bit fragmented. And so you would start having difficulty getting optimal layouts for files. And so over time, the performance of the file system would drift down. And uh, there was a group at Harvard University that was being led by Professor uh, Margo Seltzer. And one of her students decided to try and measure how much did it really degrade? How much did different file systems degrade? And uh, so how do you really do this? Well, what they decided to do was they got one of their central file servers, and they put some hooks in it so that they could just measure every single file system request that came in that made any kind of a modification to the file system. And they generated this enormous trace, which was all of the requests. So here's two kilobytes to be written. Here's four kilobytes to be written. Delete this file. Create this new file. Add this data to the file. Any, any sort of operation that modified the file system. They collected the data for three years. So they had a set of trace data, which was every file system modification request on this file server for a three year period. And then what they would do is they would take that series of requests and they could essentially test a, a file system to see how it would do over a three year period by simply creating a brand new file system, shoveling this entire trace file through it. And it took about three days to do three year simulation. But they could then look at it and see you know, what was the degradation. And of course, they didn't just do this with VSD systems. Uh, they did it with. Uh, a Windows system, uh, you know, in fact, they discovered that it just kept getting worse and worse and worse, and that you eventually had to defragment it, or they would never finish the test. Um, but for, the, for most file systems, it would, it would start out at some high level, and it would deteriorate off fairly rapidly for about a year, and then it would level out. Uh, and after about two years, it pretty much didn't change after that. And uh, this was back in the days when we didn't have infinite disk space like today. So these file servers tended to run at 95 to 100% full. Uh, in fact, there were places where you would run out of disk space as part of the tracing. And so uh, the, they, they really tended to stress how that sort of high utilization um, went through. You, in a system where you have a lot more free space most of the time, it's a lot easier to do better. So anyway. We said, OK, the problem is eventually for big files, we just don't have big chunks of continuous space anymore. And the problem is that when someone creates a file, they don't tell you how big it's going to be. So you have to allocate the space as the writes are coming into the file. Where should you allocate? Well, if you take the attitude that any file might be big, then you're going to always try and allocate in an area where you have a lot of contiguous space. Now, most files aren't big. And so what you end up happening is taking your nice big areas of contiguous space and turning them into a big area with lots of little pieces, because you have this file, and then that one's deleted, and this file, and these two are deleted, and that file. So you just end up with little chunks of space. And now when a truly big file comes along, you don't have any place that's a big chunk of contiguous space anymore. If you always try and say, well, it might is going to be small and always allocate little pieces, then even for very big files, they start off with lots of little pieces in them until you realize that they're going to be big. And then you start allocating in the big contiguous area. But they have very poor startup performance because they're not well laid out at their beginning. So what to do? Well, we realized that although you don't know how big a file is going to be initially, you do usually find out rather quickly that a big file is going to be big, because they generally get written pretty quickly. And so we came up with this idea that we would do dynamic block reallocation. And the idea of dynamic block reallocation is you assume that everything's going to be small. So you allocate it as if it's small. And then when you discover that it's going to be big, you say, ah, I should have been laying this out contiguously. And so you pick it up from where it is small, and you move that to a large contiguous area, and now continue growing. You say, well, that's a lot of extra I.O. But here we take advantage of the buffer cache. 
because in fact what we're doing is we just let it build up in the buffer cache and so reassigning it from one place to another is really just changing the tag on the buffer cache saying well actually I originally told you to put it there but where I really want it is over here and so 30 seconds later when we finally decide to start pushing it we've decided its final destination is going to be in the contiguous area and so we never actually wrote it to this first place we just write it to where it needs to go okay so with that idea in mind we essentially now uh, don't really pay any extra IO cost and we tend to keep our big contiguous areas for big files and so we put this in and sent it off to the folks at Harvard and they ran their little three-year test and what they found was with the old one it would degenerate to about 60% of the performance that it would have uh, when new and with dynamic block reallocation it only decays away to about 85 to 90% of the throughput so made a huge difference it's a fairly simple idea that's not that hard to implement but outside of the BSDs, this idea still doesn't seem to have uh, taken hold, which I find a little surprising. All right, so by the mid-90s, we pretty much had the big file performance sorted out. We were getting 85 to 90 some odd percent of the bandwidth of the disk. The place where we were starting to fall down in performance was small files, in particular the creation or deletions of large numbers of small files. Think in particular school files like mail systems or uh, other things of that sort. And so we wanted to be able to speed that up. And the other problem that we were having was that as disks were getting really huge, if you had a crash and had to run FSCK, it was taking half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half and people weren't willing to have their machines unavailable for that long after a system crash. So there's sort of two major approaches that got taken to this. Uh, journaling, which uh, is the way that many of the other file systems, such as the XT3 or uh, the Solaris version of the fast file system, manage it. Uh, we chose to do something called soft updates. And soft updates, instead of writing a journal, keeps uh, a set of in-core data structures that track the file system. And they ensure that the writes get done to the file system so that the file system is always correct. It's maybe up to two minutes behind the in-core state, but it's never in a state where it's not ready to just be used. And so uh, it also allows us to batch up changes so we don't have to write them uh, to the file system quite as often. which cuts down on the number of IOs that we need to do. So uh, with the addition of soft updates, um, we got pretty much the, the same performance that people were getting with journaling. Uh, there was the Harvard folks yet again decided to do a bake-off. So they did a, a paper that compared soft updates with journaling. Uh, and uh, what they basically find is for the what we call micro benchmarks, where you do something that's just create 8 billion files and see how long it takes, or delete a whole bunch of files and see how long it takes. Soft updates generally beats journaling, but when you look at real workloads like things that simulate a mail school or something like that, they're basically a wash. They, you know, sometimes one will do a little better, sometimes the other will do a little better. Uh, and so at the end of the day, it really was sort of a function of uh, whether you're more limited by I.O., in which case soft updates generally will win, uh, versus you're limited by memory, in which case journaling will generally win. So in the late 90s, uh, there were a number of vendors that started coming along to create what you call or called uh, NFS server appliances. Now, NFS server appliances had been around since the late 80s. I mean, Sun sold machines to be used as NFS servers. And a company called Ospex built a giant piece of hardware that was dedicated to being an NFS server. But the, th these were really sort of large, expensive solutions. By the late 90s, uh, there were companies like Network Appliance that wanted to build essentially just a small, smaller, cheaper box that nevertheless could 
uh, compete in terms of performance with these big pieces of hardware being sold by Sun and Auspex. And in fact, they were successful enough that they got uh, they drove Auspex completely out of business. And Sun's business is not selling NFS servers like it was in the early 90s. So Auspex uh, came up with a, a new way of doing file systems. Uh, they were actually working at pretty much the same time as Sun. Uh, Sun was doing ZFS. Network Appliance was doing something called Waffle. They're both a different technology. The fast file system and other file systems at that time, like EXT2 and 3, are what we call overwrite file system. So your inodes are in a certain place. Your super block is in a certain place. You read them, make changes. You write them back where they came from. If you overwrite data in a file, you generally write it over the same blocks that it was on before. The new generation, Waffle and ZFS, are what we call non-overwrite file systems. So they never write data back to where it was before. They always put it in a new place. And so you, you update an inode, you write the inode in a new place, then you update a data structure to say the inode isn't there, it's over here now. Uh, that technology is much easier to do a snapshot of because a snapshot just means you just don't reclaim the old space. And whereas when you do a snapshot in the fast file system, you have to do a copy on write model, where every time something's about to be overwritten, you have to make a copy of it. So it's, it's a more difficult thing to do. Nevertheless, network appliance popularized snapshots uh, that let you do live dumps and it let you take little backups all during the day. And so this was a feature that people were asking for and so in 1999, we tried to figure out how to do it. We have to do it as a copy on write, as I already mentioned. Um, but it creates a read-only frozen in time copy of a file system. And you want to minimize the, the time that the file system is unavailable. Although it may take 10 or 15 minutes to create the snapshot, we only have to have the file system itself frozen for five to 10 seconds. Uh, so we spend a lot of time getting ready. And then we just go boom, grab the key stuff we need, and then let it keep going. Um, we want to minimize the amount of overhead for a snapshot. So the base overhead is very little. Of course, as you start making modifications, the copy on write data can grow dramatically. But that's a function of how much you're using the file system. And you also want to have something that's efficient enough that you can have multiple snapshots. So in particular, if a copy on write operation is done, uh, we'll just do one copy on write, and then that copy will be available to all the snapshots that need it. We don't have to do a copy per snapshot. All right, so by 2001, this kept getting bigger. And so we decided to raise the default block size. 16 kilobytes with two kilobyte fragments. We now use a minimum of four sectors for even tiny files. Again, it nearly doubled the throughput, but at a cost of about 3% of additional wasted disk space. Uh, again, disk capacities are growing so quickly that increasingly the problem isn't the amount of space on the disk, but just that you can't get to all the data that's on there fast enough. There's a lot of uh, really active file systems where they'll deliberately put in lower capacity but faster disks just so they can get to the data. So wasting a little extra space to make things go better uh, seemed like a no-brainer. Well, I told you that we had done soft updates, and with soft updates, the, uh, the file system doesn't have to be checked after a crash. You just crash and reboot, and crash and reboot, and crash and reboot to your heart's content. Well, you're probably not too content if it's crashing a lot, but uh, you don't at least have to worry about the file system. So the problem, though, is that uh, the one inconsistency you can get is that you think things are still in use, but in fact, they're not. So the file system thinks there's these blocks that you're using, but you're not. It thinks there's these inodes that you're using, but you really aren't. And at some point, we'd like to go collect those unused blocks and give them back to the file system and say, hey, actually, you really can use these blocks now. And so how to do that? And I was thinking of, oh, god, I'm going to have to learn how to do real-time garbage collection or something horrible like that. And then it occurred to me, oh, we've got these snapshots. 
So I'll just snapshot the file system, and that'll give me a frozen copy in time. And since all I'm trying to do is find stuff that's not being used, obviously it's not going to ever be used in the active live file system as it goes along. So I can take as long as I want to poke around and find the missing blocks. So I just take a snapshot and point out SCK at it and say, oh, so go find the missing stuff. And it runs and runs and runs and runs. And at some point, it comes up with a list. It says, well, here's all the stuff that was missing. And of course, I can't just directly let it modify the data structures of the file system because the file system is active. So you have to add a set of system calls that lets FSCK call to the live file system and say, here, these blocks actually are free. And it, under an appropriate lock, it puts them back into the maps. <coughs> Same thing for the inodes. But it meant that I had to write about 300 lines of code for FSCK in the kernel instead of an entire garbage collector. So that was cool. Way back at the beginning of time, when we wrote the, first, the file system, the original Unix file system actually had three byte block pointers. And this was to, so they could compress the block pointers into the inode, because the inodes were only 64 bytes long. And when I was getting ready to write the fast file system, I went to Bill and I said, you know, just compressing think these block pointers into three bytes seems kind of crazy. You know, maybe what we ought to do is just use uh, four byte, you know, full 32 bit. Uh, block pointers for the file system, and Bill's like, well, you know, the chances that you know it won't fit into a three bytes is awfully small. And he did this whole calculation, and anyway, something, something waving his hands about physics and how much stuff could be packed on a disk, and came to the conclusion that it would be impossible to ever build a disk that would need more than a 32-bit block pointer. But you know, if I really wanted to to do that, I could. Well. Physics must have changed in 20 years' time because miraculously these disks started being produced um, that were more than, well, they, the disks, individual disks weren't more than a terabyte, although they will be soon. Um, and the, the old file system with 32-bit block pointers pretty much ran out of gas somewhere between one and four terabytes. And we were beginning to see these things coming across the horizon, at least when put together in grade groups. And so we decided that we really needed to go to 64-bit block pointers. Well, of course, when Sun did ZFS, they said, well, 64 bits isn't going to be enough. So they actually use 128-bit block pointers. But uh, I, I did this calculation, and the number of, of <coughs> molecules that make up the Earth is less than 2 to the 64. So I figured I'm on pretty safe ground that at least I'm going to be dead before we get to 64-bit block pointers. And at least somebody else is problem. Um, we considered doing a non-overwrite file system, because of course at this time we didn't have open Solaris. We didn't know that we'd be able to get ZFS. Uh, but that would have been a lot more work than simply taking the existing code base. Uh, and it turned out that you really could reutilize about 90% of it. Um, and in fact, when you actually look at it, UFS 2 and 1 are really just the same code base. It's just a macro DIP that sort of node which, which one it's working with, and hence what the size of a particular thing will be. So most of the existing code base got reused, uh, became stable and reliable fairly quickly, and best of all, almost all the code is shared between them, so if you fix a bug in one, you fixed it in the other as well. So the, uh, the upshot was that that came online fairly quickly, and with the release of FreeBSD 5, um, we switched over to making that the default one. Other things that have continued to be worked on, uh, in 2003, we decided that we would add this thing called extended attributes. This was all part of the uh, multi-terabyte um, work that was being done. Since we were changing the format of the inode, we figured well, we could add this notion uh, of having extra information. In the, in the Apple world, they call it file fork. So it's just a place to store extra stuff about the file. Uh, and there's just another little area of, of pointers on the inode that points to this auxiliary data. And by having it integrated into the inode rather than as sort of a completely separate inode, uh, it means that when we do fsync, 
we can make sure that all the data and the extended attributes in one operation are, guaranteed, are updated atomically. And if your attribute is critical to the file, for, as you'll see, for example, with extended, uh, or with uh, ACLs and other things that I'll talk about shortly, it's important that that thing atomically be updated. So the first use of these uh, extended attributes was in 2004 to add access control lists. The idea of access control lists is that you can have finer grain listing of uh, who should have access to the file. So instead of just having the owner of the file, the group people in the group associated with the file, or everybody else, you can just give a specific list. So you can say, Randall is allowed to read it, but I don't trust him to write it, you know. And Warner, I'm, in, I'm OK with him you know, writing the file. And so you just go through bit by bit. You can also say, you know, this group has these accesses, and so on. Now, access control lists were an idea that were originally part of POSIX in the late 80s. But that particular part, the, the POSIX standard was originally going to be this one giant standard. And that got so bogged down that they broke it into a whole lot of little pieces. So they did system calls as one piece, libraries as a piece, uh, security as a piece, networking as a piece, and so on. And the people working on the security area uh, were a little slow to get their stuff done. And so they ended up getting hijacked as part of a long story that I'm not going to go into. But uh, the bottom line was they didn't get their piece done in time. And the vendors didn't want POSIX to keep changing constantly because they were off trying to do other things. So they, there was a draft standard for how ACL should be done, but never, it was never completed. So the problem is that every vendor starts with the draft standard for ACLs and then finishes the last 20% of it in their own special way. And so ACLs across Unix sort of look the same if you look at a great distance, but as soon as you get up close to them, they're incompatible with each other. So Solaris isn't the same as HPUX, which isn't the same as Linux, which isn't the same as BSDs. And I don't even know if, if the BSDs are consistent with each other. Uh, it's problematic. And slowly, there's work today to try and bring these things together. But uh, they still have, unfortunately, subtle differences. OK. The way that it ends up being implemented in FreeBSD and uh, probably in the other BSDs, because I assume they took the code, uh, is we use the extended attributes. So we create this ACL list, which is just a list of users and groups and what permissions they should have, and we store that as an extended attribute. And atomic updates of that is easy because they can be updated with one write of the inode. Uh, now, these extended attributes are not just for the use of the kernel. Users, as well, can use the, that space to put in things that they want. Each attribute is tagged with a type. Uh, who's, who owns it? And the only choice for owner at the moment is the operating system or the user. Uh, so things like ACL are tagged as being owned by the operating system, so the user can't manipulate those. Uh, or uh, for something that the user puts in there, then the type is whatever the user wants to call it, and it's owned by the user, so they're free to change it, delete it, add it, whatever. In fact, one of the ACL permissions is, can you change the ACL permissions? Uh, so if you want to put a little picture that's associated with it, so when you draw your little screen, you can put little pictures of all the different files up there, or whatever you want to do, uh, you're free to do that. OK. Well, continuing along, uh, security continues to be an issue for the uh, all operating systems. And FreeBSD is just one that has to deal with it. Uh, so there was this notion of adding this thing called mandatory access control. And again, we need some place to store the mandatory access controls that are associated with files. Now, mandatory access controls deal with far more than just file permissions. They deal with, you know, can you create processes? Can you see processes? Many of other aspects of the system. But one of the areas that they touch 
has to do with what you're allowed to do with files. Now, we actually heard some talks earlier in this conference uh, by some of the other uh, the NetBSD people in particular uh, about how they you know, have tried to do in a slightly different way, but the same general idea of the mandatory access controls, which is you go through the operating system and you sort of tag every place in there that any sort of operation having to do with anything mandatory access control is, a, is required. So every place that there's an S user is one, and a bunch of other places besides. Uh, last time I looked at the list, I think there's three or 400 points in the FreeBSD kernel that are tagged so that the mandatory access can get a, a chance to have a say in it. And the hard part is figuring out where all those points are. And that's an ongoing process. You know, when FBSD does it, we go and look where they did it. Oh, yeah, that's another place we need to tag, and I'm sure they do the same thing. Looking at FreeBSD, well, once you have all those in there, it's now very easy to come up with different policies. So one can uh, codify you know, what a jail is supposed to look like, what, what you can and cannot do for a jail. You write up some uh, module that does that, and that's at least in FreeBSD, just a loadable module. So you say, okay, you can know, upload that module, and boom, you get that functionality. Now this work was originally done by the Department of Defense, or was funded by them. And so, of course, what they want is military sort of mandatory access control. So there's a file that's level secret, and so that file can't be seen by somebody that only has classified you know, permissions. And you know, if you give it to somebody that's very secret, then you have to make sure there's no flow of data back. And so there's this humongous module that implements all that. And if you really want to make your computer totally unusable, like a military computer, just try loading that module and see if you can get any work done. But uh, the point is that this hits, among other things, files. So being able to tag a file as secret, or very secret, or classified, or whatever, is one of the things we need to be able to do. And so for the file aspect of that, uh, again, you just add some mandatory access control labels. Those are of type system, so the user can't mess around with them. And then, of course, the, the Mac framework that you've plugged in is the one that will decide what the meaning of those labels ought to be. So from the file system's perspective, it doesn't really know what you're doing. It just says, oh, here's a, a label, or someone wants to know what the label is. We pass it out to them. So this is the symmetric multiprocessing, of course, is a process that uh, the FreeBSD project struggled with for nearly five years. I think it was five years from when they first threw down the gauntlet and said, we're going to do this, until they said, it's done, which sort of meant, well, you know, it's mostly done, and now we have to make it work you know, faster than it is. But uh, the, the giant, the, 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 started with a giant lock around the whole kernel, piece by piece multi-threading got added. From the perspective of the file system, the first piece of the file system that got SMP was the vNode interface, which is where we plug in all the file systems. Uh, the disk subsystem, the part that's below the file system, got done in about 2005. And it wasn't until 2006 that the fast file system itself got the, all the locking put through it. And this was over the period of time 2006 was close to the end of that project, so the file system itself actually got uh, SMP relatively late in the process. Okay, so that's what I have to tell you. You've now seen the, the entire history of the FAST file system uh, compressed into a period of uh, 40 minutes. I suppose I should have gone a little slower on that. I got a little excited, I'm afraid. Um, for those of you that uh, didn't get to my talk last year. I uh, do have my little DVD here, which is three and a half hours of the full history of BSD, which includes what I've talked in here and obviously a lot of other things. So uh, these I sell for the princely sum of 2,500 yen if you are interested. Um, and I will also take any questions that people have. Um, the, the numbers of additional uh, the percentage of additional wasted disk space what, that you used 
when you increase the block size, but for first 1.4% and 2.9% and then something like. Uh, was that cumulative or was that additional? So no, going that from was each time that was additional from the previous So time. it was ended so up like being like 6% in yeah, the end? Yeah, it was about 6%. Mm -hmm. Part of the savings that we got was that we originally held 10% of the blocks in reserve to mm -hmm. be able to do good layouts. And it turns out, especially as disks get bigger, you don't need as much of percentage-wise as much space. So we dropped, although we took 2% more in inefficiency, um, we gave back 2% of that reserve. So we dropped that to around 8%. And some folks have dropped it down to 5%, uh, which is fine if you don't have a lot of really big files. But if, you, if your file system predominantly is big files, you're really better off to keep it up around 8%. And the other thing is that users just don't really know how big the disk is. So if you hold a little bit back, they don't really know it. No, you just wanted to get a number on, on how much to increase yeah. it. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's around 8% <laughs> over what it would be if we ran with the original. So you're up, you mentioned 4% of bandwidth the disk early on. Yes. What's the bandwidth the disk that you currently get out of, say, UFS2 or UFS1? Uh, the, the bandwidth that you get out of, of the file system is largely a function of what you look at. So if you are reading and writing giant files, you can get north of 90% of the bandwidth of the disk. If you're doing a lot of small file I.O., you're going to get significantly less than that because there's so much mucking about with creating and deleting stuff. Even with soft updates, um, you're, you're not going to get the performance that you would out of a large file. Questions? Okay, thank you. And if you have other questions, you're welcome to come up and ask me afterwards. Thank you.